have to say that uh, after that very generous response, I'm not sure I should risk it by saying anything, uh, but thank you very much for having me here. I've been coming to ALEC meetings, I think, since either 1979 or 1980. And I think ALEC is extraordinarily important because it both represents the implementation of federalism at the state and local level and a focus on ideas as the key to solutions. And I just saw, if you, if you watch this panel, you begin to understand why ALEC matters. And you take all the different things that ALEC has been working on. Uh, and I'm very proud of Lisa. She, she was a key player, as I described it in the book that came out recently called March to the Majority, which took you through 16 years of trying to create a majority. And then the four years uh, with Clinton where we got four, the only four balanced budgets in your lifetime. And Art Laffer was a great help. You know, <clears throat> Art understood the key notion that with enough economic growth and reasonable fiscal policy, you can get a balanced budget. Without enough economic growth, it is impossible to cut spending enough to get to a balanced budget. And so I will say also, I know a number of you heard today from Jody Arrington, and uh, Jody has done extraordinary work at the House Budget Committee and they produced a 10-year plan to get back to a balanced budget, uh, which I think is the first time in recent times it's been done uh, basically since I left there. But remember, when we left, the momentum of welfare reform, the momentum of the largest capital gains tax cut in history, the momentum of its very significant regulatory reform, we were growing so dramatically and we were controlling spending so effectively that Alan Greenspan, as chairman of the Federal Reserve, announced that they were projecting that we would pay off the U.S. debt by 2009, and they had a working group on how you would manage the money supply <clears throat> if you had no debt. Now, we only ever once in our history, in 1837, had a brief period of literally zero debt, and I'm not sure we had gotten there, but the, the guys who came after didn't quite understand what we were doing. Uh, <clears throat> I would just say to you that uh, what Alec is doing whether it's on very inventive and very important efforts to develop a new approach to the faculties. I'm, I'm doing a series of uh, something like 30 articles at the American Spectator going back to 1960 and looking at how the cancer has emerged across our whole system, of which the campus is only a tiny part. But it's literally true that Ronald Reagan defeated communism in Moscow and lost to it at Stanford. And the fact is we've had this constant, steady metastasism uh, in our bureaucracies, in our news media, uh, and uh, in our campuses. And so what you heard here today was really, really important. I also have to say that, that uh, uh, we have uh, worked very hard on, on uh, the whole issue of transparency, and, and I can't imagine an award that was more deserved than the one you got because uh, when she first came into our office, it was like a you know, very, very bold idea. And it's now beginning to be common sense. And with Alex's help, uh, I think, what, 20-some states have now adopted transparency laws. And <clears throat> what you have to understand is when you go through big change, the other side gets to fight back. So if you want school choice, the teachers' unions will go crazy. If you actually want hospitals and insurance companies to tell you their real prices, they will go crazy. So it's, you, you can't just win the first fight. You have to go through an entire process of winning again and again and doing it. And that's where I think Alec plays a major role in networking ideas across the whole country. Uh, and to me, uh, this is one of the most important meetings of the year in developing solutions and in moving the system forward. I will say I think one of the things we're not good at is in one of the places where I studied under Ronald Reagan for a generation is the whole ability to articulate vividly and clearly. The other side has the power of automatically moving to moralistic and emotional language. <clears throat> so of course the fact you happen to be Vietnamese, which probably wasn't even true. You were probably a white slaver who happened to be in Saigon uh, the week that they fell, and then you claim to be Vietnamese because you thought that would somehow help you. But your friends on the college campus know that deep down, you wanted to be a white nationalist. <laughs> I mean, 
This is, this is the left, isn't it? So just a, just a couple of observations. And I literally began studying Reagan in 1965, and I uh, began working with him in 1974. I recommend to all of you a remarkable book called The Education of Ronald Reagan, uh, which was a study of Reagan at uh, the eight years he was a General Electric and what he learned. Despite all the years I'd worked with Reagan, only after I read that book did I realize how strategic his approach to communications was and what he was trying to accomplish. He understood Lincoln's principle that with public sentiment, anything is possible, and without public sentiment, nothing is possible. So let me just give you one example that hit me the other day. <clears throat> I was writing an article for the, uh, and I apologize for my throat. I, uh, when I fly long distances, my throat dries out. And, uh, so if you'll pardon me. But anyway, uh, what, what I'm struck with is, I, I was doing a piece for the New York Sun about what Mayor Adams is doing to the city. And what Mayor Adams is doing is routinely cutting city services in order to take care of Biden's illegal immigrants. And what hit me as I was writing this is that, and I'm, I'm telling you all this because all of you can go back home and help get this started. If we have a problem of illegal immigrants, that's a natural phenomenon. It's like, you know, you have tsunamis and you have earthquakes. But if you put the word Biden in front of illegal immigrants, you begin to understand, no, this is a deliberate policy of swamping America with people who come here illegally. And the, and the person developing and f supporting that policy is named Biden. And so New York City is going to have their public libraries close on Sundays to transfer the funds from New Yorkers to, illegal, to Biden's illegal immigrants. They're going to have the next five classes of the police academy closed to save the money to transfer to Biden's illegal immigrants. Now, the reason I say this is, and I was meeting earlier with the, with the Michigan delegation, and I've, I mentioned to you, some of you who may want to talk to the folks here from Michigan, I'm very happy to do Zoom meetings with state legislative groups uh, to share ideas, to talk about solving problems. And they have this wonderful moment, which Republicans are just almost genetically incapable of communicating. <clears throat> they have a governor who has decided that the people of Michigan owe Xi Jinping millions of dollars in order to build a battery factory for a Chinese company in Michigan to further collapse the American auto industry. And I said to him in passing, you ought to figure out the cost per Michigander, turn it into a check signed by Whitmer to the people of to Xi Jinping and the Chinese people, and send it around and say that there are two futures here. And this goes back to something I learned many years ago from a governor of Ohio who kept getting reelected because he would come to an event like this, he would pull his wallet out, and he'd say, what this campaign is about is simple. Wham, it's about your wallet. I want to put money in, my opponent wants to take money out. Which do you want? Well, making it vivid and clear is a key part of this. I just sent a note to Art Laffer, which he will later on claim he thought of, although I signed it. Uh, but I said, this is something that only hit me over the last two years as I was advising people like Jody Arrington. We need a Laffer curve for regulations because we need to understand that we do, you know, <clears throat> in a complex society, you have to have some regulations. On the other hand, there's a point where the regulations become more, more painful and more expensive than whatever they were trying to solve. And I would say to get back to 3.5% average growth, which both Art and I are deeply committed to, along with Larry Kudlow and Steve Moore and others, you have to have both a tax change and you have to have a regulatory reform change. Now, I've, I've been thinking a lot about coming here because I do think this is an important event. And I think we have so many opinion leaders from all over the country that uh, I, I, I treasure this as one of the places annually where I get to think about things. And what hit me uh, 
working on the American Spectator series, which has been a real revelation, um, I went back and reviewed Theodore H. White's remarkable books on the making of the president uh, for 64, because I wrote a column on, on how Goldwater shifted the Republican Party dramatically to the right. 68, which was when the Democratic establishment collapsed. And I'm now finishing up uh, today on the airplane going back home a uh, piece on 72, which is when McGovern and the hard left takes over the Democratic Party. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and I'm about to do a piece next week on rethinking 1974 as the first journalistic legal coup d'etat. Because we've all bought into the Washington Post narrative of Watergate when what hit me, when, when you read Theodore White looking back, he was astonishingly insightful. In the close of his book on 1972, he says, this was a fight between the news media and the president. And McGovern really didn't matter. And the hatred the Washington Post had for, the, for Nixon was unbelievable. And you can see the setup for what would come because, of course, here you are on the left, and you suddenly look up, and this guy you hate gets 60% of the vote. Well, you can't allow that to exist. And so an entire industry grew up to prove that he was illegitimate. And it's amazing when you go back and you look at this stuff. Um, in that context of looking at the long view, I would offer you my summary judgment, both as a historian and as somebody who's been involved in political process since August of 1958. Um, I think we are in greater danger if you combine the foreign challenges, the domestic cultural challenges, and the economic challenges. <coughs> we are in greater danger today as a country than any time since Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas night, 1776. I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think that we are all kidding ourselves. I've, I've been telling people that to understand the left and its approach to violence, whether the violence is a criminal or a terrorist or Russia, you have to assume that they <clears throat> saw The Lion King and they thought it was a documentary. And they believed that lions and zebras sing and dance together. And when you say to them, well, you know, lions actually eat zebras. They go, no, they don't. Didn't you see the movie? Why, why are you behaving so anti-lion? And that's why things like the savage assault of October the 7th, <clears throat> oh, they always come as a shock. 900 cars have been carjacked in your nation's capital by Thanksgiving. And it's a shock. And so what hit me, though, was we're equally guilty. We keep believing in a fantasy world. The fact is today, there are three, we have three huge assignments as citizens, not as politicians, not as Republicans or Democrats, as citizens. The first assignment is to have an honest assessment of the requirements of survival. <clears throat> we are so underestimating the dangers of nuclear war we're so underestimating the dangers of indirect conflict using cyber and other capabilities. <coughs> We're so underestimating the spread of terrorism that we are people who are sleepwalking, much like the 1930s, where the only person in the West who had actually read Mein Kampf was Winston Churchill. And he was so ridiculed that by the middle of the 1930s, out of 635 members of parliament, he had four voting with him, four out of 635. And then Hitler proved that Churchill was right. Well, we're in far, and, and the danger is not just military. Our school systems, if you benchmark our school systems against China, it is, it's absurd. We can't possibly remain the leading country in the world when Baltimore City has five high schools in which not one student, not one, can do math. 
we need a genuine, honest, national debate about the cost of survival in a real sense. Second, we have to decide that sustaining American civilization is worth the fight, and that's where this panel is so important. We have to say very firmly and very clearly, you don't want to say the Pledge of Allegiance, you're not going to be around here. If you're not prepared to think that America is a country worth protecting, you know, if, if, if you're here on a student visa and you decide you want to go out and be pro-terrorist, we're going to deport you. But, we, but you've got to have a willingness. <clears throat> and I think, frankly, not only should we be looking at the public universities, but I'm increasingly inclined to think we should take away the tax-deductible status of the great private university. Harvard, Harvard last year made a billion dollars net profit, a billion dollars on their endowment. It's impossible for their alumni to have any pressure on them. And so what you have is the growth of a hard left oligopoly eager to defend and protect itself. And that's going to require, remember, the other team gets to fight too. None of these things are going to happen easily. You go to the Pentagon and ask for a serious, real strategy for survival, you're going to be in a fight with so many generals you can't believe it. I know this. I helped found the Military Reform Caucus, and we ultimately passed a bill, the Goldwater-Nichols Bill, against the active opposition of every active duty four-star. So you go in and say to them, tell us what it would really take to be safe, and how many rice bowls we're going to break, and how many bureaucracies we're going to break. And they're going to say, you know, I don't know that we have to be all that worried. Just give us another 100 billion or two, and we'll all be happy. Yeah, but we won't be safe. Third, and this is where Alec plays a key role. <coughs> In the end, what the American people want isn't liberal or conservative. It's, it's deeply American, but it's not liberal or conservative. They want things to work. They want to be able to turn on the water faucet and have clean, healthy water. They want to be able to drive on a road that's paved to a soccer field that's safe to watch their kids play. <clears throat> they want a sense that you can create a job, that you can go out here and earn a living. Our job across the whole movement <coughs> is to apply valid historical conservative principles in a way that solves problems <coughs> excuse me, and can be explained to the American people as to why their life will be better. So when we talk about health transparency, the key is you will have better choices with your doctor. You'll know in advance what it's going to cost you. And the system will migrate towards much higher quality. And when you realize that the British National Health Service, the great socialist adventure, now has 7,200,000 people on their waiting list, including thousands who've been on the waiting list for over a year. And what we want is a system that's constantly dynamic, that uses things like uh, artificial general intelligence, that migrates to the best solutions and the best outcomes at the lowest cost with the greatest convenience, and that's what you get with an informed market. <coughs> now, <coughs> When you go do that, as you've learned, every oligopoly, including your local hospital, including the pharmaceutical company, including the medical technology company, including the insurance company, every single one of them is going to go, oh, it's so complicated. You don't understand. And what they really mean is, I want the money. And so what we want to explain to the American people is, we want you to have better choices for better outcomes at greater convenience at lower cost with a constantly evolving use of technology and science to save your life and your children's life. That is a system that can, in fact, win the country. <coughs> Excuse me again. I apologize for my voice. So do we have a couple minutes for questions or not? You are my leader. So she, this is a great system. She is my leader, so she's turning to whoever her leader is. Floor mic, but um, are there questions? We, ha we probably have time for one or two. Anybody want have a question? Yes. Yes, right here. Um, 
Well, this is a good example of the weight of the news media. Uh, the level of anti-Semitic and anti-Israeli bias in the media is, is, is frankly as great as the bias on campus. So for example, there was a four-month-old orphan who was released the other day. Now, what the media did not go into any great detail about is why was that four-month-old an orphan? Because her parents had been killed on October 7th by Hamas. So what you get is a continuous, unending effort to minimize the humanization of Israelis and to maximize the, the humanization of Palestinians. When the truth is, you could have all of the emergency aid in Palestine tomorrow morning, you could have reconstruction in Palestine tomorrow morning, all you'd have to do is get rid of Hamas. So the, 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 the number of, you know, the, to, to use the language of the Iranians, the number one bad player is Iran. The number two bad player is Hamas. Both of them are deliberately bad. The Iranians recently, you know, they routinely chant death to America and death to Israel. Recently, the Ayatollah said, this is not a slogan. This is a policy, okay? Hamas has said recently, they had one of the people on television saying, we're gonna attack again and again and again until there are no Jews left. Now, my personal view is they have to destroy Hamas, period. I am for, I'm for the most humane effort. I'm for the most careful effort. I'm for minimizing civilian casualties in a world where you can't tell who the civilians are. But I also think we have to put some real responsibility on the Arab world. You know, thousands are being killed in Syria. Well, that's not a big problem. <clears throat> Thousands are being killed in Yemen. That's not a big problem. But if the Israelis go in to, after people who, who massacred the equivalent of 37,000 Americans, do you know how endlessly ruthless we would be if 37,000 Americans were butchered by terrorists? And frankly, when I see somebody who cuts off the heads of babies, I don't, I'm sorry, this may be a sign that I suffer either from white guilt or something, I don't want to, whatever thing the left wants to say, I accept it. I think an organization which cuts off the heads of babies is evil, and evil should be destroyed. Thank you all very, very much.